Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today, and if you've been um, sort of marathoning our lectures last minute, hey! (laughs) Um, So last time we continued PowerPoint 6, which we will end today, um, by discussing, um, well finishing our discussion on World War I basically. I'm talking about the nurses who volunteered, the organizations like the American Red Cross, and how there were many that served um, both on the battlefield and in um, other hospitals. Um, We also had women who drove ambulances, um, transporting anywhere from bodies to medical supplies. Um, We talked about the women who were able to join the military, even though they were non-commissioned. They were able to serve mostly stateside, um, doing clerical work, switchboards, um, translators, other stuff. Um, Translators include Hello Girls, who were responsible for translating um, French messages for us. Um, We talked about the Donut Girls and how they made donuts um, on the battlefield as well. And generally how women helped during this time, right? There, If it wasn't for women helping during World War I, it maybe wouldn't have been as successful as it was, right? Um, excuse me for the stutter. So, and then we moved on to Madam C.J. Walker, um, who was the first black um, multimillionaire. And how she revolutionized hair care products, um, not as so much the products themselves, right? Because she got it from Annie Malone. But the fact that she marketed so well and created a system whereby she trained independent, mostly black women um, to go door to door and teach women to use her hair care products and to um, use better hairstyles um, and less harmful um, chemicals on their hair um, revolutionized black hair care for years to come. So and we also discussed progressive reform and how... um, During the early 1900s, with um, corruption of businesses, poor um, food preparation, you know, anti-alcoholism, women were not only dealing with reform, but they also um, were more inclined for romance in their relationships. They were fighting against child labor, and there were also plenty of new inventions that made their domestic lives a little bit easier, right? Like with the invention of the vacuum, for example. And I mentioned a couple women last time who um, sort of were leaders in their own reform movements, Um, but today I would like to discuss someone who fought for birth control specifically. Now, usually when I teach this in class, I will um, ask, you know, my students um, to tell me what the different methods of birth control are, and we sort of list them and take a look at them, right? There weren't a lot of birth control methods um, in the past, right, before the 1960s, which is really when the birth control pill was um, invented, you didn't have a lot of options, right? We'll talk about how the diaphragm, um, which is a um, sort of rubbery insert that you insert into the vagina to block the cervix, um, you know, <laughs> this isn't a sexual health class, but we kind of have to talk about this. Um, we also, They also had condoms back then as well. Um, you know, in ancient times or just in generally in the past, they would sometimes make condoms out of um, sheep intestines or other inte- animal intestines, um, which I always thought was an interesting fact. So just in general, we didn't have a lot of options. And Margaret Sanger's dream was for a method of birth control, aka the birth control pill, where women could take it regularly and um wouldn't necessarily have to worry about getting pregnant all the time. Okay, so this is what Margaret Singer looked like. So let's talk about her. I also talk about some of the problematic things about Margaret Singer because it's important to keep that in mind. And if you take a look at the first video, there's a short biography on Margaret Singer. So Singer was born Margaret Louise Higgins in 1879 in Corning, New York. She was the sixth of 11 siblings, born to parents who both emigrated from Ireland during the potato famine, which most of you are probably familiar with the potato famine and how, um, you know, the potato crop failed in Ireland and that led to an increase of Irish immigrants to the U.S. She enrolled in 1900 at White Plains Hospital as a nurse um, probationer. 
In 1902, she married the architect William Sanger and gave up her education. Though she was plagued by a recurring active tubercular condition, right, tuberculosis and problems with the lungs, Margaret Sanger bore three children. She also threw herself into radical politics and modernist views of World War I, um, and she sort of um, hung around Greenwich Village in um, New York, which is famous for the Bohemians in the early 1900s, people who sort of spoke out against the injustices of society. They would later become the hippies in the 60s. She joined the Women's Committee of the New York Socialist Party and took place part in labor actions of the industrial workers of the world. So she um, hung around a lot of um, very progressive people um, and liberal people, by that meaning ones who question society, ones who want more social programs to help people, um, ones who dare to question the government, right? So... Her political interest emerging from feminism and nursing experience led her to write two series of columns on sex education entitled What Every Mother Should Know and What Every Girl Should Know. Um, And these were published between 1911 and 1913 in a socialist magazine called New York Call. Her articles were extremely frank in their discussion of sexuality, and many New York Call readers were outraged by them, Um, and I'll talk about why that is. Just briefly, this is the first, one of the first times I've mentioned, like, feminism or somebody being part of the feminist movement, so briefly I'd like to explain that feminism is the belief in the equality of the sexes, okay? It's it's not the man-hating, bra-burning like, idea that many of our parents and grandparents have, okay? Essentially, feminism is the belief that everybody should be equal and that women traditionally are oppressed and treated as second-class citizens, and thus it will take a lot of work on our part and society's part in general in order to make sure that we're finally equal, okay? So that was her belief. Um, one reader stated that the series contained a pure morality than whole libraries full of hy- hypocritical cant about modesty. So some people were really outraged by her articles. Some people actually loved them, right? During her work among working class immigrant women, Sanger met women who underwent frequent childbirth, miscarriages, and self-induced abortions for lack of information on how to avoid unwanted pregnancy. Okay, so let me break that down quickly. Um, So there are a lot of especially poor women who maybe couldn't afford to go to a back alley and get a condom, um, who weren't informed of how to prevent sex, right? Um, The pull-out method was, I guess, something that some people did, but it wasn't widely talked about, right? Sex in general was not really um, talked about. It was kind of taboo um, in a lot of ways. And um, so miscarriages, right, um, are when your body fails to carry a child to term, right? So the body sort of rejects the um, fetus um, from coming to full term and ejects it from your body. Uh, Many women go through this, um, and recently there have been more talk by famous women about their um, difficulties with their miscarriages, okay? Um, Also... Self-induced abortions, right? They included, we'll talk about abortion more when we get to Roe v. Wade. Um, But essentially, self-induced abortions could be anything from using a coat hanger um, to sort of make your body eject the fetus. Um, You could have somebody um, harm your uterus, and that will um, trigger a miscarriage. You could fall down the stairs. There are lots of things. Um, that women did that were very dangerous. And again, when we get to the topic of um, Roe v. Wade, which made abortion largely legal in our country, um, we'll discuss these different methods. So um, frequent pregnancies, Margaret Sanger did not believe women should go through that because, again, they were very dangerous. There are still women who die from childbirth, and there were more during this time as well. Um, Also, it's traumatic for each child that's born to be born from a mother who has had several children, right, in some cases. Um, 
Plus, I mean, it's expensive to take care of kids, and this was preventing a lot of women from achieving the dreams and goals that they wanted to do. So Sanger did not believe in this type of life for women. So access to contraceptive information was prohibited on grounds of obscenity by the 1873 Federal Comstock Law and a host of state laws. Um, So the Comstock Law was passed in um, 1873, and it basically not only forbade porn, right, so pornography you couldn't sell through the mail or distribute through the mail, um, but also you couldn't get any information on birth control, right? So no pamphlets, no cards, whatever, telling you like, hey, this is how you should avoid having a kid. Okay. I mean, this even in a lot of ways prevented doctors from telling their patients how to prevent getting pregnant, right? And we'll talk about it wasn't until the 60s when a lot of um, medical facilities were finally allowed to coach their um, patients on how to use contraceptives. Okay. So um, many people aren't aware it took so long for this stuff to happen, you know. Seeking to help these women, Sanger visited public libraries but was unable to find information on contraception. She opposed abortion, but primarily as a societal ill and public health danger, which would disappear if women were able to prevent unwanted pregnancy. So basically she said, you know, um, abortion shouldn't happen and wouldn't happen if women were taught how to prevent pregnancies and they wouldn't need abortions. So this is um, a small excerpt from that um, periodical I told you about, What Every Girl Should Know, and this is what Sanger said. In conclusion, I cannot refrain from saying that women must come to recognize there is some function of womanhood other than being a childbearing machine. Too long have they allowed themselves to become this, bowing to the yoke of motherhood from puberty to the grave. So this also indicates that Um, becoming a mother is a lifetime responsibility, right? You just don't raise your kids until they're 18 and then forget about them, right? This is your whole life. This is your responsibility. And she is disavowing the fact that women are expected to do this automatically. Nowadays, more women are choosing not to become mothers and instead focus on their careers and um, personal life ambitions, Okay, plenty of pictures of Sanger. (laughs) So again, right, did not support abortion, instead supporting birth control to prevent abortion. So Sanger came to believe that only by liberating women from the risk of unwanted pregnancy would fundamental societal change take place. She launched a campaign to challenge government censorship of contraceptive information. In 1914, she launched the Women Rebel, an eight-page weekly, sorry, eighth-page monthly newspaper, which promoted contraception using the slogan, um, No Gods, No Masters. Um, Collaborating with anarchist friends, um, anarchy means that you believe um, there should be no rules in society and sort of have sort of this chaotic existence, right? No government control at all. Um, Sanger popularized the term birth control as a more candid alternative um, to the traditional um, names that they had for it, including family limitation. Um, Nowadays, um, we refer to birth control also as family planning. Okay. Um, So she proclaimed that each woman should be the absolute mistress of her own body, which many women agree, right? She viewed birth control as a free speech issue. Um, And when she started publishing The Woman Rebel, one of her goals was to provoke a legal challenge to the Comstock laws, right? That was her main mission. So she also prepared Family Limitation, which was another publication, and it contained detailed and precise information and graphic depictions and descriptions of various contraceptive methods. In August 1914, however, she was indicted for violating postal obscenity laws by sending the woman rebel and um, the other family um, limitation periodical through the mail, okay? And she fled the country. So basically, she got in trouble because according to the Comstock laws, um, you can't send this type of stuff through the mail. So she ended up fleeing the country. 
Um, she spent 1914 in, in exile in England. Um, and she visited a birth control clinic in the Netherlands in 1915. And she learned about diaphragms, which I explained, um, and were convinced that they were better um, methods of birth control than what they had in the United States. Um, however, they were generally unavailable here. On October 16th, 1916, um, when she returned to New York, she opened a family planning and birth control clinic at the 46 Amboy Street in Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn, the first of its kind in the United States. So it's the first time we had a birth control clinic. Nine days after the clinic opened, she was arrested, um, but she continued seeing some women in the clinic until the police arrested her a second time. Um, she was offered a lenient sentence um, and was sentenced to 30 days in a workhouse. Um, after World War II, sorry, World War I, excuse me, she founded the American Birth Control League, or the ABCL, in 1921 to enlarge her base of supporters to include the middle class. Um, and their founding principles included things like um, conceiving children through love, um, born of a mother's conscious desire, meaning they believe that women should or babies should be born because the mother wants them, right? And only begotten under conditions which render possible the heritage of health, meaning that babies are born to safe, stable environments where they'll be supported. Um, so here she is when she was old. She established the Clinical Research Bureau, CRB, in 1923. It was the first legal birth control clinic in the United States, staffed entirely by female doctors and social workers, right? So that Brooklyn clinic I mentioned before was illegal, so this was the first legal one. It received funding from John D. Rockefeller Jr., who's the son of famous um, tycoon John D. Rockefeller, um, and the Rockefeller family, um, who made anonymous um, donations for years to um, these clinics. From 1916 onward, she lectured, um, she delivered lectures to um, various different people. Um, however, she did also deliver lectures to the women, the Ku Klux Klan, which is one thing she's problematic for, right? Um, she's also believed to be a Nazi sympathizer as well. So um, many people um, point to those things and they're like Margaret Sanger wasn't a big hero she did believe in um, very oppressive things in the 1920s she received hundreds of thousands of letters many of them written in desperation by women begging for information on how to prevent unwanted pregnancies 500 of these letters were compiled into the 1928 book, Motherhood and Bondage. Very, very important book. If you ever want to look into um, how these women felt during this time, right, how they struggled. Sanger also worked with African-American leaders and professionals who saw a need for birth control in their communities. She ended up opening a clinic in Harlem, New York, staffed with black doctors in 1930. Um... She did not tolerate bigotry among her staff, meaning like racism and oppression and things like that, nor would she tolerate any refusal to work within interracial projects. Okay, so it's, Sanger's an interesting figure, right? Because I just told you that she was not afraid to link herself with the Ku Klux Klan and the Nazis, but then she also um, helped black communities as well. So, you know, interesting. In 1932, she ordered a diaphragm from Japan in order to provoke a decisive battle in the courts. The diaphragm was confiscated by the United States government, and Sanger's legal challenge led to a 1936 court decision, which overturned um, the Comstock laws, uh, which prohibited physicians from obtaining contraceptives. Okay, so in summary, basically, she used a Japanese diaphragm in order to prove like, hey, doctors should know about this and at least suggest this to their patients. And she won. Right. It motivated the American Medical Association in 1937 to adopt contraception as a normal medical service and a key component of medical school curriculums. So not only could doctors offer it, but now they were being taught it in medical schools. 
1948, she helped found the International Committee on Planned Parenthood, which evolved into the International Planned Parenthood Foundation in 1952, and is the world's largest non-governmental international women's health, family planning, and birth control organization. So there are Planned Parenthoods everywhere today. Um, They provide all sorts of services, um, including birth control, right, family planning, aka support systems for um, expecting mothers. A small percentage offer abortions, but that's what they become synonymous for and why their funding is often cut because of that. Um, And they also offer um, women's health, like pap pap smears and mammograms for little to no money for you. So um, very important organization. And if you take a look at the next video, you can see um, sort of a video on the history of Planned Parenthood. Sanger was the organization's first president and served until she was 80 years old. She died of congestive heart failure in 1966 in Tucson, Arizona at the age of 86, about a year after the U.S. Supreme Court case Griswold v. Connecticut, which legalized birth control United States. Um, was successful. And and we're going to talk about that as well. Um, So in general, just a couple other things. She opposed excessive sexual indulgence. Um, She said that every normal man and woman has the power to control and direct his sexual impulse. Um, So essentially she said that people should not be humping like rabbits. You know, she she didn't believe that. Um, And she believed that birth control would Um, prevent women from being seen as an object of lust, which, I mean, didn't work, but, you know. Um, She said that masturbation was dangerous. Um, She said, I had never found anyone so repulsive as the chronic masturbator. So, you know, there's that. But she did um, sort of support homosexuality, so let's take a look at what she said about that. You know, she had a lot of opinions. So she said, the question of homosexuals making the thing a, not exactly a perverted thing, but a thing that a person is born with different kinds of eyes, different kinds of structures, and so forth, that he didn't make all homosexuals perverts, and I thought he helped clarify that to the medical profession and to the scientists of the world as perhaps one of the first things to do that. So she's kind of, you know, using the terms that we don't approve of today, calling, you know, homosexuality sort of perverted, right? which is a traditional thing that people use to make homosexuality a taboo. Um, But she's also sort of likening it to the other things we're born with, sort of indicating that she believes that you're sort of, you are born um, homosexual, right? Which is something that is um, widely accepted today. So here she is outside of um, one of her New York City clinics, um, talking to some women and mothers we're sort of thanking her for what she's done. So next is going to be a very tragic topic. Um, I mentioned before about female labor unions and how they tried to fight for better working conditions. Well, in the early 1900s, a lot of businesses were getting away with malpractice or ill practice, I should say, and essentially not making their work environment safe, especially ones who hired women because they could hire women cheaper. Um, So this is the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory in New York City. Um, These are the women that work there. Um, Some of these women ended up dying in a tragic fire. Um, And that's our next topic. So the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire in New York City, which you can see um, a video explaining that um, from the History Channel in our next video. So take a look at that. So the fire happened on March 25th, 1911 and was the deadliest industrial disaster in the history of New York City and one of the deadliest in general in U.S. history. The Triangle Waste um, Shirt Waste Company Um, occupied the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of the 10-story Ash Building in Greenwich Village um, in New York City. And as you can see on the left, there's the building. Um, You can see firefighters are trying to extinguish the fire. 
The factory normally employed about 500 workers, mostly young immigrant women who worked nine hours a day on weekdays, plus seven hours on Saturdays, earning um, $7, between $7 and $12 a week. At 4.40 p.m. on Saturday, March 25, 1911, as the workday was ending, a fire flared up in a scrap bin under one of the cutter's table, tables at the northeast corner of the eighth floor. So essentially, these women were cutting um, fabric most of the day to make shirt waists, right? Um, material that you use in your outfits, right? And um, a scrap bin essentially is where they threw the excess material they didn't need, sort of like a garbage can, and the fire started in that garbage can. The first fire alarm was sent at 4.45 p.m. by a passerby on Washington Place who saw smoke coming from the 8th floor. The fire marshal concluded that the likely cause of the fire was the disposal of an extinguished match or cigarette butt in the scrap bin, which held two months' worth of accumulated cutting. So basically, somebody threw their cigarette or match in it and it lit up. A bookkeeper on the 8th floor was able to warn employees on the 10th floor via telephone, but there was no audible alarm and no way to contact staff on the 9th floor. Although the floor had a number of exits, including two freight elevators, a fire escape, and stairways down to the street, flames prevented workers from um, climbing the stairway, and the door to the other stairway was locked to prevent theft by the workers. So the bosses literally would lock these doors and you couldn't get out because they thought people were stealing from them. It's crazy. The locked doors allowed managers to check the women's purses right at the end of each day. Dozens of employees escaped the fire by going up the Green Street stairway to the roof. Other survivors were able to jam themselves into the elevators while they continued to operate. Terrified employees crowded onto the single exterior fire escape, which city officials had allowed um, instead of a required third staircase. So the fire escape ended up twisting and collapsing from the heat, spilling about 20 victims nearly 100 feet to their death. So this fire escape collapsed and these women fell and died. Um... The firefighters' ladders only reached the seventh floor, so the firefighters couldn't climb up and get to these floors. Um, And people would literally stand by and watch as over 62 of these victims jumped or fell to their death from the burning building. Um, So I'm going to flip to the next slide real quick and I'll come back. So here's what an eyewitness said of this event. They said, horrified and helpless, the crowds, I among them, looked up at the build, burning building, saw girl after girl appear at the reddened windows, paused for a terrified moment, and then leap to the pavement below to land as mangled, bloody pulp. This went on for what seemed ghastly eternity. Occasionally, a girl who had hesitated too long was licked by pursuing flames and, screaming with clothing and hair ablaze, plunged like a living torch to the street. Life nets held by the firemen were torn by the impact of fallen bodies, right? So they had nets instead of the big inflatable things that firefighters use so people could jump out and land safely. And literally people were falling through these nets and dying. Um, Crazy stuff. Okay, getting back to this. The remainder waited until smoke and fire overcame them. Almost all modern references agree that 146 people died, um, including 123 women and 23 men. The company's owners, Max Blank and Isaac Harris, who survived the fire by fleeing to the building's roof just as it began instead of telling their employees, were indicted on charges of first and second degree manslaughter. Um, This trial took place starting December 4th, Um, and the prosecution charged that the owners knew the exit doors were locked and didn't do anything about it. The investigation found that the locks were intended to be locked during working hours, but the defense stressed that the prosecution failed to prove that the owners knew that. Um, So they were acquitted of these charges, so which means they didn't go to jail for all these women dying and men. 
but they were found liable of wrongful death um, in 1913. And the um, workers who sued them for this were awarded 75... um, Oh, sorry. The workers who... um, sued them for this, were not granted money. However, the owners were awarded $75 per victim in compensation. So can you imagine that if your boss locked the doors and let you die and then they get $75 for you? That's crazy. Here we go. This picture is some of the victims um, lying in some makeshift coffins. And I'll show you some more grueling pictures from this. A New York City Committee on Public Safety was formed to identify specific problems and lobby for new legislation, such as the bill to grant workers shorter hours in a work week, known as the 54-hour bill. The New York State Legislature then created the Factory Investigating Commission to investigate factory conditions in this and other cities and to report remedial measures of legislation to provide hazard. So basically what New York ended up doing in response is they started appointing field agents who would basically go to these factories and warehouses and they would investigate them and see if they were safe working conditions. And this is one of the first times in this country that that's happened, right? I don't know if any of you know somebody or have worked in an environment in a factory or, um, you know, environment like this, but I mean, they have inspectors more regularly now who check to make sure you're all safe, right? Back then, they didn't really have that. Also, New York City required that you had to have fire extinguishers on site, you had to have alarm systems, and you had to have sprinklers and other things that would have easily prevented these women from dying like this. So that's why this is super important. So this is what the fire escape looked like. Remember I told you that this collapsed and over 20 women ended up falling to their deaths because of this? can see how mangled the building is from the fire this is where their workspace what their workspaces look like after the fire ravaged through it so you can see it's completely destroyed and these are a couple of the bodies who ended up either jumping or falling out of those um, floors and dying So let's move on to a different topic since this is a pretty sad topic. Um, For the remaining topics for today, which are about three, um, we are going to discuss the movement for the um, 19th Amendment, which is the Voting Rights Amendment. Um, So firstly, we need to discuss the women who actually fought against the vote because there were women and still are women today who disagree with the woman's right to vote. As you can see on the left, here's one of their um, flyers. It says, no votes, thank you, the appeal of womanhood. And of course, this has to do with the cult of domesticity. So the New York Times, after first supporting suffrage, reversed itself and issued stern warnings. A 1912 editorial predicted that with suffrage, women could make impossible demands, such as serving as soldiers and sailors, police patrolmen or firemen, and would serve on juries and elect themselves to executive offices and judgeships. So essentially it's like, well, if we get women the vote, then they're going to want to do jobs that men traditionally do. What the hell, right? It blamed a lack of masculinity for the failure of men to fight back, warning women would get the vote if the men are not firm and wise enough, and it may as well be said masculine enough to prevent them. So essentially, the New York Times is blaming men and saying, you guys aren't man enough to stop these women from asking for their rights or demanding their rights, really. Anti-suffrage forces initially called the Remonstrants or organized as early as 1870 when the Women's Anti-Suffrage Organization was formed. Widely known as the Antis, they eventually created organizations in some 20 states. In 1911, the National Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage was created. 
It claimed 350,000 members and opposed women's suffrage, feminism, and socialism. It argued that women's suffrage would reduce the special protections and roots of influence available to women, destroy the family, and increase the number of socialist-leaning voters. Society women in particular had personal access to powerful politicians and were reluctant to surrender that advantage. Okay, so firstly, these women, the society women, right, the wealthy women, um, they believed that they got the vote, they would have less power over the men in their lives who actually made politics, so they didn't want to give up that control. These women, too, largely did not support the vote because they were conditioned under the cult of domesticity to believe that in the separate spheres, right? So this goes back to public versus private. They believe that if women were involved too much in the public sphere, aka voting, that it would affect and destroy the private sphere, right? Because women wouldn't be in the home taking care of their families. They would be out voting and doing whatever, right? So these women were operating off of that ideology. Most often, the aunties believed that politics was dirty and that women's involvement would surrender the moral high ground that women had claimed and that partisanship would disrupt local club work for civic betterment. Right? It's taking women from their roles as the religious and moral um, sort of top of society and turning them into um, sort of um, political feminists, right? The concept of the new woman emerged during this time as well, which I'll talk about will sort of counter this idea that women had to stay inside all the time. So basically, the anti-suffrage movement will continue um, beyond the passage of the 19th Amendment. And when we get to the 1970s slash early 1980s, we will talk about the women who um, fought against an equal rights amendment that almost got passed. Okay, so we'll talk about that more extensively later. If you take a look at the next video, you will see um, Vice News interviewed a woman back in 2018 who actually does not want women to vote anymore. And she explains her reasons why. So you can see that there are still women today who are anti-suffrage. So here's another one of their flyers. They said danger. Women's suffrage would um, double the irresponsible vote. It is a menace to the home, men's employment, and to all businesses. Okay. So during this time, there was a the new woman, right? This new sense of um, it's a new century. Um, women had access to things like bicycles and eventually cars where they could pretty much go where they want without um, needing a man to help them. Um, this idea that they could be smart and independent and they could think for themselves. This was emerging and this contributed to the suffrage movement and the idea that women deserve the vote. So here are some of the suffragettes, okay, the women from the first wave, right, we're still in the first wave of the um, women's rights movement. And let's talk about how they um, actually got the 19th Amendment to be passed. On the left, you can see what the suffragette uniform looked like, okay, essentially white blouse, usually white blouse, um, dark or white skirt and a sash um, around them as well. So we talked about in this class, right, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, Alice Stone, um, Susan B. Anthony, right, um, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, all of these women who fought using protests, um, who got arrested for trying to vote, who started conventions, all of this stuff all led up to this moment, okay? Now, getting the vote. In January 1917, the um, NWP stationed pickets at the White House. Remember we talked about that before, the National Women's Party um, 
led by um, Alice Paul, chained themselves to the White House so that they could get the vote passed. Um, this sort of escalated tensions between women and the government, sort of showing the government that women were not about to back down. Tension ex escalated in June as a Russian delegation drove to the White House and um, these members, these women who were chained themselves to the White House, they unfurled a banner that said, we the women of America tell you that what America is not a democracy. 20 million American women are denied the right to vote. President Wilson, Woodrow Wilson um, was president at the time, is the chief opponent of their national enfranchisement. Woodrow Wilson also um, is noted for um, sort of getting us through World War I. Um, he also created um, the League of Nations, was, which um, eventually turned into um, the UN or the United Nations. Um, he was also a member of the Ku Klux Klan, which I like to throw in because that's important. So the police, whose actions had previously been restrained, began arresting the picketers for blocking the sidewalk. Eventually, about half of the 200 picketers that were arrested went to prison. And this was negative publicity because these were mostly white women. And people did not like to see a bunch of white women in prison. Okay. So this put pressure on the Wilson administration, um, particularly because... World War II, World War I, excuse me, as I mentioned, um, after the end of it, women in like England, France, all of these European countries were getting the vote, but American women weren't. So this put pressure on President Wilson. In September 1918, he spoke before the Senate um, calling for approval of the suffrage amendment as a war measure saying, we have made partners of women in this war. Shall we admit them only to a partnership of suffering and sacrifice and toil and not to a partnership of privilege and right? So on January 12, 1915, um, so three years before Wilson got up and advocated for this amendment, a suffrage bill was brought before the House of Representatives, but was defeated by a vote of 204 to 174. So we could have had suffrage um, much earlier. When another bill was brought in January 1918, it failed to get enough votes again. But in, on June 4th, 1919, it was brought before the Senate. And after a long discussion, it was passed with 56 yeses and 25 noes. Finally, on August 18th, 1920, Tennessee ratified the 19th Amendment making it the law throughout the United States. Okay, so let me explain how this, how bills and stuff work. Okay, so essentially, um, well, this is an amendment which um, is an add-on to the Constitution. Now, it's not a law, okay, so which means that um, if Congress decided to vote to get rid of it, they could, technically. I know a lot of women who would fight against that tooth and nail, you know. So what happens is it's presented before the House of Representatives who need to get a majority vote on it. Um, the House of Representatives is made up of um, representatives based on state population. Then it moves on to the Senate. We have 100 senators, two for each state, and they vote and it needs a majority. Then it moves on to the president who signs the amendment, sort of um, giving the stamp of approval. Then it's sent out to the states, and what the states do is they need to adopt the amendment into their own constitution, which signifies that they accept that this amendment is official. This um, amendment, right, the 19th Amendment, needed 36 states to do so, and Tennessee was the last one um, to become so, right? Now, I say in the slide, the amendment becomes law. Now, it's not an official law. I just say that so that you know that it, it's, um, it's recognized throughout the land, just like a law. But again, amendments aren't um, permanent. We can always get rid of them. Okay, so just to clear, it, um, clear up any confusion. So... The 1920 election became the first United States presidential election in which women were permit permitted to vote in every state. 
The last states to pass the 19th Amendment were Georgia, Louisiana, and North Carolina, who all passed it in 1971. So as you can see, it can take years for all of the states to catch up, right? Delaware was the last state to accept the 13th Amendment, which got rid of slavery, right? So this seems like a long time. <laughs> so this is what the woman voter looked like to women, right? You're a baby, then you start reading, you grow up, you sort of start working, you fight for the vote, and now this is what the woman vote voter looks like. They said, that has not been put back, right? So the clock continues. We are not going back into the past. We are new voters. So that's the end of PowerPoint 6. We're, I'm going to do one last topic to start off PowerPoint 7, and we will be finishing up this PowerPoint um, in our next lecture. So this one's titled Women Between the World Wars. Um, so this is mostly going to cover the 1920s and the 1930s. So we will be discussing the Roaring Twenties as well as the Great Depression. So these are um, women voters after the 19th Amendment was passed um, during that 1920 election. Sort of trying to get other women to vote and I'll talk about why not every woman decided to um, use their new rights. So this is what the 19th Amendment actually says. It says, The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by United States or any state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article, blah, blah, blah. Like, the, the last part is in every amendment. I forgot to also introduce um, the la previous video, um, which is the Sound Smart series summarizing the 19th Amendment. So you can check that out if you want. These lectures go by fast. <laughs> so here on the left is um, a woman and her child advocating for women to actually vote. So our last topic for today is the new woman voter. Okay. So the 19th Amendment... Um, Afterwards, many legislatures feared that a powerful women's block would emerge in American politics. Um, so a voting block is essentially um, a group of voters with like-minded interests. So there's a voting block for um, various minorities, for women, for um, gay rights, environmentalists, all that stuff. There's different voting blocks. This fear led to the passage of such laws as the Shepherd Towner Act of 1921, which expanded maternity care during the 1920s. However, a woman's block did not emerge in American politics until the 1950s, so they worried for nothing. In 1920, just 36% of eligible women actually voted, um, compared to 68% of men. The low turnout was partly due to other barriers to voting, such as literacy tests, long residency requirements, and poll taxes. These are things that disenfranchised um, African American voters in particular for years, right? The literacy test, essentially you take like a small version of the SAT just to vote. Long residency requirements mean that like if you move to a new place and tried to vote, not good. And poll taxes, you essentially had to pay every time you voted. These things are illegal now, although some states are trying to bring them back to suppress voters. Inexperience with voting and persistent beliefs that voting was inappropriate for women may have also kept many of them from turning up. Many American Indian and Asian immigrant women remained disenfranchised because they were denied citizenship, so they didn't really get the opportunity to vote. African American women in the South were still subject to voter suppression, so they also couldn't vote. And because women did not vote as a bloc, their influence didn't sway many elections. Um, I'll sh I should also mention Native American women also took forever to be able to vote. So um, when people talk about, um, because last year was the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, um, that was mostly for white women. The National American Women's Suffrage Association became the League of Women Voters. It was founded in 1920 to support the new women's suffrage rights. It was a merger of National Council of Women Voters, 
founded by Emma Smith DeVoe, and the National American Women's Suffrage Association, led by Carrie Chapman Cant, or sorry, Cat, um, and was six months before the 19th Amendment gave women the right to vote. So women were already organizing um, these voter organizations just before the 19th Amendment was passed. Originally, only women could join the League, but in 1973, it was modified to include men. The um, League of Women Voters operates at the local, state, and national level with over 1,000 local and 50 state leagues. It is nonpartisan, meaning it doesn't um, ally itself with a particular political party. Um, It does, however, support a variety of progressive public policies, including campaign finance reform, universal health care, abortion rights, climate change, environmental regulation, and gun control. So if you take a look at the last video, you will see um, a promotional video by the League of Women Voters, and you can see what their modern, um, their modern agenda is, basically. So that is it for today. Um, next time, we are going to talk about the 1920s, um, a decade a lot of um, particularly women are interested in. Um, We'll talk about the flappers and their style um, and how that was sort of a rebellion against Victorian ideals. We'll talk about the Harlem Renaissance and how black women thrive during this time. Um, We'll also be getting into the Great Depression and um, why our economy collapsed. Um, And we will also be discussing my favorite first lady, someone who is pivotal during the 1930s, as well as a woman who um, still largely is embroiled in mystery as to her whereabouts, right? Someone who disappeared for a very long time. 